<laughs> Sean, you want to open? Because there's no one named Galatians here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lord, just uh, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for just uh, watching over us. And um, yeah, I'm just thank you for the ways you blessed us, Lord, and for just uh, the ways you've delivered us and delivered Morningstar from the fire. Thank you that you're an all powerful God, that we can never think too big of you. And I pray that uh, you give Trevor wisdom and the words he's saying today, revelations, and that, uh, yeah, our heart and our mind would just be fixed on you and our entire trust to be in you this time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before we get into Galatians, we want to sort of do an introduction to Paul's epistles. Now, in the New Testament, Paul's epistles are arranged longest to shortest. Um, only God knows why. Or probably the guy that put them in order figured out that he would do it this way because it was easier. But uh, they're best understood in their historical context. So how many missionaries' journeys did Paul do? Three. Unless you're Trevor and you say four, and Genesis says four, uh, and you'll find out why in a minute. So in the first one, he starts in Antioch, and he goes into this southern part. Um, and you'll see this area is known as Galatia. Um, I have a pointer. Oh, it's there. You can use this as your I think, still. And then, uh, then he went home. <laughs> then he took a second journey. And this time I went a little further. This is where he had the vision of going to. So he's over here, and he's not supposed to go south, he's not supposed to go east, he's not supposed to go west, or north, sorry. So he goes into Europe, and he has what they call the Macedonian call. And he comes down to Europe in what's today known as Greece. He comes through here, then he sails back to Jerusalem and back up to Antioch. Um, up here is Thessalonica. And down here is Corinth. Over here somewhere is the boot of Rome. And that's something to keep in mind for the next slide. So he's back in Antioch and he goes through again. Uh, and he makes his trip through. And then the fourth journey, I call it a missionary journey because Paul wanted to go to Rome. Uh, and God wanted him to go to Rome. He just didn't know how he was going to get there. You know, sometimes you end up in places that you thought about, but you never thought about how you'd get there. Uh, Paul thought, I think, about making Rome his new center for missions. So missions started out in Jerusalem. Uh, that was the base, and everything went out from there. Then they went to Antioch. They went out from there. They was in uh what's known as Turkey in, in Asia Minor, and everybody in Asia Minor knew. Uh, then he was over in here doing the uh, Macedonian Peninsula, and this all was shared the gospel, and he thought the next logical place would be, if you, if you were here, then you were here, then you were here. Isn't that sort of the next logical step? Just And so uh, even though he didn't, uh, do this missionary journey quite the um, we'll call it the typical uh, manner that you would go on a mission trip he went to rome now the interesting thing is when you take a think about his thing after his first missionary journey he wrote one letter galatians during his second missionary journey he wrote two letters first and second thessalonians during his third missionary journey, he wrote three letters. So it's easy to remember. One, two, it's easy. One, two, three. Uh, first missionary journey, one letter. During the second missionary journey, two letters. During the third missionary journey, three letters. 
during the fourth missionary journey when he's in jail, uh, he wrote four letters, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. So that's pretty easy to remember, isn't it? And then he gets out of prison, and he writes Titus and Timothy. And then somewhere between he getting out of prison and writing 2 Timothy, he gets put back in prison. And so 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. And so you'll see the reason we're doing Galatians first and not Romans is because we would like to sort of see the progression of what the gospel was doing and what the believers were going through, uh, rather than going Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, and going through it that way. Does that make zero sense? Um, can you show the four journeys again? I didn't get how that works. Uh, the, the last journey was uh, going to Rome, but then what was the one His third missionary journey when he was in Greece and Macedonia again. Open recent. So his first journey was just into Turkey, into Asia Minor. Um, the second journey took him through Asia Minor, but then he got into uh, Macedonia, and look, this part is all known as Greece today. Then his third journey is very similar to his second journey, uh, except it was a much bigger beeline, and then he just followed it all the way, almost through. He went one way, and then he went backwards over the same route. And then he sailed by boat down to Jerusalem. And then his fourth journey, he's arrested in Jerusalem. So that's where it starts. And he makes his way as a prisoner. And so we'll read about Rhodes and we'll read about Crete and we'll read about Malta all through in the book of Acts as his trip, as he's traveling as a prisoner back to Rome. And if you look at this on the bottom, it says BibleStudy.org. That's where I copied them from. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put the last slide up? You're taking pictures? Yeah. I just told you the whole secret. Yeah, BibleStudy.org. <laughs> oh, the one I didn't <laughs> copy? You want the one I didn't copy? That one? <laughs> Who would want one that I made myself? <laughs> I, I could just send you a PDF of it. That's the wrong one. Oh, I wanted to do James first and then we'll come back. So let's listen to James on Galatians. A.T. Robertson calls this epistle a bugle blast of freedom. Scholars may debate whether the letter was sent to North or South Galatia and disagree about the date of its writing, but no one should mistake Paul's message. The letter is unusual in that it's written not to an individual like Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, or to a local assembly like Corinthians, Philippians, or Colossians, but to a group of churches in the region once known as Asia Minor, now in the land of Turkey. It's also different from Paul's other letters because he usually begins with an encouraging look at the believer's position in Christ. He's generally slow to what we call the point. Having read the first chapters of Philippians or Colossians, we might think, what an ideal church. But Paul then turns from their position in Christ to their present condition and the need to be conformed more into his image. Most of the first century saints, we discover, pretty much struggle with the same problems we do. But Galatians has no gentle beginning. Paul immediately launches into his concern for them. He presents his twofold theme in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, the grace of Christ and the gospel of Christ. To Paul, you couldn't have one without the other. 
The grace of Christ was the oxygen that gave life to the gospel. A dangerous heresy was gaining strength in the church. Imported from Jerusalem, they were claiming that salvation required both faith in Christ and the keeping of the law. Paul's rebuttal in Galatians is crystal clear. It seemed that in order to push their perverted gospel, these Judaizers found it necessary to undermine Paul's influence among the Christians. But he shows that in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, that number one, his gospel came directly from heaven, from Christ himself. Two, that the other apostles in Jerusalem were in perfect agreement with the gospel that he preached. And three, that when Peter linked himself with some of these Judaizers, Paul stood up to him, and the Christians agreed that Peter's position was wrong and Paul's was right. The epistle has a simple three-part outline. Chapters 1 and 2 present Christian experience as authenticating salvation by grace alone. Chapters 3 and 4 present Christian doctrine as requiring salvation by grace alone. And chapters 5 and 6 present Christian character as the fruit of salvation by grace alone. Although Paul is very straight with the believers, this epistle has some of the sweetest statements in the Bible. Chapter 2 and 20 has given many the secret of victory. The description of the fruit of the Spirit should inspire us to daily abide in Christ. And we with Paul can revel in the wonder that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And that's a scripture snapshot of the book of Galatians. Okay, so the book of Galatians is probably the first one written. Some people, like Jay was mentioning, they argue maybe Thessalonians was the first one written. I tried to show in that map that Thessalonica was in Macedonia, Greece. Galatia was the area he visited in his first missionary journey. So it would make more sense that he would write a letter to the Galatians before he would write a letter to the Thessalonians we hadn't met yet. Also in Galatians it says, who has bewitched you? How, how could you go so quickly from the gospel I preached to you? And it would be more make more sense if that was the only part he went to. So if he went on the second missionary journey and then wrote Galatians, why would he say so quickly departed? And so that's sort of my argument. Could be wrong, but that's why we're doing Galatians first. And Galatians is uh, in Asia Minor, an area known as Turkey. And so this was, here it says Galatia. So you can see he left Antioch, went to Perga. Of Galatia, Antioch, another place called Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and then he made it back uh, to Antioch again. So that's why I believe Galatians was first, but I could be wrong. Now, Galatians is a liberating book, and it assaults the bondage of legalism more directly and more efficiently than any other book in the Bible. <laughs> um, and then my question, since my pointer only works on Windows and not on Mac, what is legalism? And before I you say anything, I'm going to say probably eight out of ten of you will give me the wrong answer. What is legalism? And it's okay to be wrong because we're going to learn. Danny? It's the idea that performance or keeping certain rules that's the way you find something sort of you're on the right track explain it a little more fully and I think you would be the two out of ten okay let's put it this way then what's the difference between legalism and obedience
obedience is out of respect for the person we will as for a reward. <laughs> what do you mean by reward? I think you're sort of on the right path too. Like you're receiving something back for okay. what you're doing, or you're getting something you can do. It's not, you're not just doing it for what you want to. Okay. Well, that's lots of times in the Bible, uh, especially here when we're dealing with legalism, it's talking about adding to the gospel. So, this is what does the gospel, what does Jesus say about the gospel? What does Paul say about the gospel? What does Peter say about the gospel? What do you have to do to be saved? Believe. That's all you got to do. I'm trying it again. Oh, what'd you do? <laughs> I don't know. Did you have a little something? Awesome. He installed Windows on my Apple computer. <laughs> <laughs> Just Excellent. So lots of time, legalism is adding something. So you have to believe in Jesus, and you have to be baptized. Believe in Jesus, and go to our church. Believe in Jesus, and speak in tongues. Believe in Jesus and work at Morning Star Bible Camp. <laughs> Believe in Jesus and something. It's adding something that Scripture doesn't include, and as uh, Byron said, to get a reward, to get a benefit out of it. Obedience is doing what the Lord says because He's the Lord. <laughs> so it's so if I say, uh, let's pretend Magnus is a bank robber, <laughs> it's, it's the government's fault, actually, because, well, in the olden days, the only ones that wear masks were people on Halloween, people with chainsaws that ran around on October 31st in the middle of the night named Jason, and uh, bank robbers. <laughs> Did he? Was it Freddy then? Chase on that screen, Michael Myers. <laughs> anyway, but now in modern days, the government forced you to wear a mask. So I don't know if bank robberies went up or not during the last year and a half, but I would imagine so because it's very easy to not be detected anymore. Assaults went up, the racism. Racist events went up as people hid behind their masks. That's why I'd imagine bank robberies didn't stay at a standstill. Uh, now, if I say, you know, Magnus, robbing banks, you shouldn't do it. Is that legalism? Oh, Trevor, you're such a legalist. How do you expect me to get any money? <laughs> <laughs> got to do something. And I don't want to work eight hours a day. They only want to pay me $20 an hour. Uh, this is way easier. I go in, I spend five minutes, they give me $7,937.16, and uh, I'm set for the week. Why would anybody want to work eight hours a day? Well, his argument makes sense, doesn't it? And then I would say, but the Bible says. Is that legalism? Or is that obedience? Or is it on my part, is it care? Now, some of us were wondering the other day, whatever happened to the word care in health care? And so we want to draw a difference between legalism and obedience. Uh, if you're going to force somebody to do something, that's legalism. Letting the Spirit of God work on a soul and convict a person of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. That's obedience. Because if you are convicted by the Spirit of God to do something, that's a whole different ballgame. So if I tell him, and he's thinking, oh, that's right. It says right here in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not rob banks. 
And even though Trevor's robbed banks before, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. I have all these pens from banks I don't belong to. <laughs> I don't know how I got them, but I got all these pens. It says Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank of Canada, Scotia Bank. I didn't buy them, and I don't think anybody ever gave them to me, but I have them. So I stole them from banks. Uh, what's the difference between law and grace? These are the themes Paul having. Oh, were you going to answer it? Nope, go ahead. Okay. So the law, you like get what you deserve, and grace is like you get what you deserve. You get what you don't deserve. Oh, yeah, I would go with that. Um, so you do something or you don't do something, the law always has punishment, doesn't it? Grace is getting some unmerited, undeserved favor from someone. When you see a gracious person, what would a gracious person do? Well, for example, you go to a gracious person's house. What would happen if you're at a gracious person's house? Who give you food? What would they do before they gave you food? <laughs> they might invite you in. <laughs> Come on in. Have a seat. <laughs> I've been to people's houses and I've sat stood at the door for half an hour talking. Never got invited in, never got a glass of water, never got anything. A gracious person would, well, you don't deserve to be in my house, but they'd invite you in anyway. You don't, haven't earned a glass of water, but I'm going to give you one anyways. Then we get to Danny's point, you get some food, even though you weren't invited for dinner. That's what I used to do when I was your age, just show up about four o'clock at somebody's house. And it's not so close to dinner time that they think you're trying to get a free meal out of them, but it's early enough that they think you're just visiting. And by the time you're done chatting with them, it's five o'clock and they invite you for dinner. At least the gracious people would. The other one, sometimes it's, you had to go to McDonald's anyways. <laughs> But it, the book of Galatians talks about having the freedom to have a relationship with the living, transcendent God of the universe is really living life as it's meant to be lived. You see, if you're under a full set of rules <coughs> and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do the other thing. There's no freedom in that. You have to do it. You have to do it. Someone's forcing you to do it. Is that freedom if someone's forcing you to do something? But when you're in a relationship with the living, transcendent God of the universe, now you get to start living life the way it's supposed to be lived because you're in a relationship with him. And you'll read the scriptures or somebody will share some scriptures with you. Uh, and you know, you know I, I really need to add that to my life. That's not part of my life right now, but they're not saying read the Bible every day. And if you don't read the Bible every day and get through the Bible in a year, you're going to hell, you know. That's my rule. But if you're reading the Word of God and it's sweeter than the honey from a honeycomb to you, and someone says, isn't this just wonderful what God says here? You know, yeah, you know. It is kind of a cool verse. I never really noticed that one before. Then you start maybe thinking in your mind, I wonder how many other really cool verses there are in the Bible. I guess I'll have to start reading it to find out. And you'll find some really strange parts like, 
the beginning of First Chronicles where it just had lists of names and lists of names and lists of names. And you'll wonder why God would ever do something like that. <laughs> That's for last month when we talked about Chronicles. And so you'll have to come back in a few years when we go through all this again. Um, but when God starts working on you, and the Spirit of God convicts you that you ought to do something or you ought not to do something. This is living with God controlling your life. This is living with God ordering the footsteps of your life. This is living with God putting the desires, his desires, in your heart. The Judaizers that came into the Galatian region were telling people, you know, you got to be baptized. you got to do this. you got to not baptized, circumcised, sorry. And if you don't do this and you don't follow the Ten Commandments, you don't follow the 613 other laws that there are, and if you're not going to Jerusalem and if you're not doing this and you're not doing that, you're not really saved. And they were adding to the scripture. But God wants us to live life, the eternal life, the abundant life. And that's a very strong warning to us against the corruption of the gospel. You see, Paul said that's not the gospel. And he didn't adjust it, he didn't change it to make it more appealing to people. He said, this is the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, according to the scriptures, was buried, and he raised it again on the third day, according to scriptures. He didn't adjust, oh, those people like getting circumcised? Well, sure, we'll add that to the gospel. Um, do you know what Maria's name is in Mexico? No, Mary's name? Maria? <laughs> Maria, well, <laughs> so, sort of. But, but Maria isn't really important in Catholicism in Mexico. It's someone named Guadalupe. She looks very similar to Mary in a lot of respects. But she was the ancient Aztec goddess. And the Catholics came in and they adapted their gospel. And instead of Mary, Holy Mother of Jesus, uh, they changed it. See, this is changing the gospel. This is changing the rules. Paul never changes the rules. He never changes the gospel. It's always the same. It never gets adjusted. Oh, we're in a rich culture. We'll change it. If the gospel is you believe in the Lord Jesus and you give $1,000. Although there are people on TV that do that. Paul would never do that. Peter would never do that. And the Lord Jesus would never do that. Um, what happened to works then? Aren't you supposed to behave yourself? Aren't you supposed to be obedient? Aren't you supposed to not do bad things? Aren't you supposed to do good things? Are they important? Ephesians would say we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The good works are the evidence that something's happening in us, isn't it? When we take a look at the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5, it's talking about these are evidences that God is working in your life. If you run around like Oscar the Grouch the whole time, you guys know who Oscar the Grouch is? Yeah. Who would be a modern day Oscar the Grouch? If you ran around like Oscar. That's just fine. Um, there's a pretty good chance that the Spirit of God isn't working in you because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. <laughs> What is this? Let's say Oscar the Whereas if you're a cookie, that's a whole different cookie monster. That's a whole different ballgame. See, it's for a cookie. It's good enough for Oh, I love cookies. You see, the works are going to give the evidence that God's working. The changes in your life are the evidence that God's working. And so we don't work to get saved. 
We're saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. There's always good works accompanying it. And good works aren't what we, you know, going down to the gospel mission and feeding people or... Good works is the change that God is working in our lives. And that's the book of Galatians, in a nutshell. Any questions? Now that I can see you again. Okay, no questions. You're free to work on your assignments. If you have any questions, we're here.